Hey everybody, we're here on the Gulf Coast and we're going to be learning about oyster biology as well as oyster farming and conservation. Scott, tell us about the AU Fish Lab. What does it do? So they, the, the Auburn University Shellfish Lab was established in 2003. It was when we officially opened our doors. It was set up to conduct practical research to support the shellfish industry uh, in the state of Alabama, uh, across the Gulf of Mexico in the region. But a lot of our research applies worldwide. A lot of what we talk about is, is oyster aquaculture or shellfish farming, uh, but there's a lot of things that go with that. So we look at best management practices for off-bottom shellfish farming. We look at uh, harvest practices. What's the best way to take that product to market and, and keep it healthy and keep the consumer healthy? Uh, we look at uh, diseases of shellfish. Uh, there are diseases associated with shellfish that have no, uh, they're, they're not a problem for humans, but they're a problem for the shellfish. Uh, so we look at those, those aspects of it. We also look at human health concerns of eating shellfish. A lot of us like our raw oysters. Yeah. Well, that comes with some health concerns. Uh, there are bacteria that can cause problems. So what we want to do is we want to, to do the research and also teach people what are the best practices for harvesting to keep that, that, that product safe. Um, a lot of that has to do with, with getting that product out of the water and into refrigeration quickly. So not only do we do, we do research here, but we work in conjunction with, with other universities and other agencies like the FDA. We work with them at looking at some of our culture practices of, of raising shellfish and how we can, we can use those culture practices to pr provide a, a safer product to the market. Um, so in addition to culturing shellfish, we're also looking at, at how shellfish interact with the environment. What are the ecosystem services that shellfish provide? So shellfish provide a lot of habitat especially oysters, they create reefs, mm -hmm. and that is habitat for, for other organisms, crabs, fish, shrimp, other things use that reef structure as, as habitat. So we look at those things, but in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, we see kind of a general decline in oyster reefs. And so we want to look, how can we, how can we rehabilitate those reefs? How can we enhance the fishery? So in addition to looking at farming, mm -hmm. we also want to look at how can we help the natural environment. So we do a lot of projects looking at restoration mm -hmm. uh, and fisheries enhancement by, by providing, you know, uh, for instance, the, the oyster set on whole oyster shell uh, for planting on bottom. Um, we look at, at different types of methods of raising oysters for restoration. And, and how we can use that to, to benefit the, the natural environment. Wow, that's a lot, of, a lot of cool work going on down here. So can you walk us through the whole process? Sure. Okay, so the, the, the process of creating oysters either for our own research or for uh, our oyster farmers all starts by spawning the oysters. Uh, and this is our spawning system here. This is a system we developed here at the Auburn Shellfish Lab. Each of these containers, uh, we, we put an adult oyster in each of these containers. And we manipulate temperature on the oysters to get them to spawn. So basically we're tricking them into thinking it's springtime. Uh, you have cool nights, warm days, that temperature change in nature is what causes them to spawn. So we're just trying to mimic that here, 
here in, in the spawning system. So we, we put each adult oyster, these are broodstock oysters, these are, these are probably two or three year old oysters. We put one oyster in each container. Um, and we want to have the oysters separated so that we can control everything about the fertilization of, of, of the eggs. Okay? So when we manipulate the temperature, these oysters will start spawning. Um, and what happens is you, these, these oysters will open up a little bit. And when they start spawning, the females will clap their shells together and they'll throw out eggs all along the margin of the shell. The males will just stay open and they'll send out a steady stream of sperm out one side of the shell. So when they start spawning, we can, we can identify the males from the females. So at that point, once they start spawning, we've got about an hour to get those eggs fertilized. So from here, where does it go? Like once the eggs have done and sperm have done their thing, where does it go? Okay, so uh, once we have the eggs, mm -hmm. Uh, again, we're talking about millions of eggs. So from there, they're going to go to our culture tanks out in the hatchery. At this point, those eggs are going to develop into a free swimming larvae. You don't think of oysters as swimming, but for the first two weeks of their life, they're up in the water column swimming around as a larvae. So we're going to go out here to the hatchery and see where they go from here. Want to tell us about now what happens? Okay, so from from the spawning room, the fertilized eggs come out to these culture tanks. So this is a larval culture tank. This is a, a thousand gallon tank or about four thousand liters. We stock the the eggs in here at about twenty million a tank, and that's about that's about ten per milliliter. Sounds like a lot. When you put them in there, you're not going to see them. Uh, so they're that small. So these are, these are tiny microscopic larvae. Um, over the course of the next two weeks, we will drain these tanks down like this. And these bags catch the larvae. It gives us a chance to assess the health, grade the larvae. And we reduce densities. So we, we initially stock these tanks at 20 million a tank. Over the course of the two weeks, we're going to drop that density down to about 12 million a tank. Reducing that density keeps the growth rate high, uh, keeps, keeps the larvae growing fast, but it also keeps the water quality in, in good condition. So how does that, um, the algae get into the water? Okay, so, so our oyster larvae feed on single cell phytoplankton and a lot of commercial hatcheries grow their own algae. Growing algae takes a, a, a large footprint and it takes uh, a lot of personnel. Uh, we don't have that luxury. So what we use, we use an algae concentrate. Uh, we, get a, we, get, we order in an algae concentrate and we resuspend it in the water and then add it to our tanks. So we know what the optimal density or the, the cells per milliliter for our larvae to feed efficiently is. So when we put our larvae in the tank, we add algae to the tank to, to get to that optimal feeding density. These, these spider web of lines you see overhead, these are algae lines and they are on a timer. Every 12 minutes or so, a timer kicks on and algae is brought through these lines from a refrigerator and, and drops into the tank. So we're adding algae into the tank to maintain that optimal density to, to keep those, those larvae feeding efficiently and growing as fast as we can grow them. So they've been in here, um, the larvae, has been in, larvae have been in here for two weeks. So where do they go next? Okay, so from here, uh, we go from a free swimming stage to where they settle out and attach to a substrate. And we provide that substrate for them. So the, the way we tell that they're ready to settle out of the water is when they reach a stage called an eyed larvae stage. 
the shell has a little, what looks like a little dot on it. Uh, we call it an eye spot. It's actually an internal structure. So when we start seeing eye spots on the larvae, that's when we know that they're getting close to ready to set. So from here, they go out to our nursery. And we can go take a look at yeah, that now. Let's go that. Okay, so when the, when the larvae are ready to set, they, they come out here. This is our nursery. So after the two-week swimming phase, they're ready to settle out of the water column and attach to a substrate. So we got to provide them a substrate to attach to. And the substrate we provide depends on how we want to use it. So in these cages over here, we've got whole oyster shell. And we provide that oyster shell for them to attach to. This is a, a, a setting method for restoration projects where we want to grow a, a natural oyster that's going to grow in, into a clump like you think of being on an oyster reef. So if you want to take, you want to take a look at some of this? So these, these have been set for about three weeks. So that, these are individual little oysters that are set all over this shell. So over time, these oysters are going to grow up, they're going to grow into each other, and they're going to grow up into clumps and form that, that natural reef type oyster. We fill tanks with shell in these cages. We put larvae in here at about 100 larvae per shell. And what we hope is we get a set rate like this, where we've got about 20 oysters per shell. So they attach themselves. You don't go in and like force it. Right, right. That, that larvae finds a, it, its spot that it likes, mm -hmm. and then it cements itself down. And it, from then on, it, it's a sedentary animal. It's going to be on that shell forever. Um, what we hope is that we go plant these shells on bottom, on the bay bottom, and they form a reef structure. And out of these 20 on this shell, what we hope is that about three of them survive to adulthood. So we've got a variety of projects that we use this for. We've got an oyster gardening program, We've got uh, different restoration projects that we use them for. Uh, so this is this is, is strictly a technique for restoration. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about oyster gardening. How does it all work? Okay. So oyster gardening starts with recycled shell from the Alabama Oyster Shell Recycling Program. So basically it comes out of the restaurants. That shell is seasoned over a period of months. At that point, we're able to take it, take it to the shellfish lab over on Dolphin Island, have it set with oyster larvae, so baby oysters. And from there, we're able to distribute it to our citizen scientists where they provide nursery care for four to six months, depending on the geographic region, how fast they're growing, that sort of thing. Uh, after that period of time, the oysters have grown up to usually around two and a half to two and three quarter inches. We collect all the oysters from the program, take our final measurements, uh, and then we take them out to restoration sites in the bay where we plant these uh, degraded sites or sites that we're trying to build back up uh, for our restoration effort. And once we plant them, they're there being oysters, uh, spawning, filtering, providing habitat, uh, sort of completing that cycle from the restaurant back to the water. So Just what do you mean by seasoned shell? So seasoned shell, when we take this shell from, like, if you're in the, if you go to a restaurant and you order a dozen half shell oysters, it'll be cleaner than this. This just came out of the water, but, you know, it's sitting there on the plate and you eat your oyster, but there's little bits of oyster tissue there. If it's a baked oyster or something, there'll be butter or cheese or whatever that's stuck in there. Lots of organic matter. We can't have that back in the water. Uh, as that decays, consumes a lot of oxygen. It's not good. So we take them and season them, meaning that they spend about six months minimum on land. They get turned kind of like you would a compost pile. Fire ants crawl up through there, eat all the little bits out of it. And after that time period, there's nothing left but a shell. And so there's no organic matter left, no soft tissue uh, that remains, just a, a plain oyster shell that we're then able to take and set quite efficiently in the hatchery. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about your role as an extension agent? How does that 
Right. So from an extension standpoint, you know, our job is to take the science and put it in a form that's consumable uh, by our stakeholders. And so we're able to borrow quite a bit of information from the science that's coming out of the farming side, uh, provide some educational opportunities about what that is, why that is, and then switch it in a way to make it applicable to a restoration effort uh, where the target environment of restoration is something that's important to the stakeholder. You know, people live on the water, they play in the water, you know, they, they have a vested interest in the quality of the water. And so this gives them that opportunity to, to engage in the science, uh, help us learn more about what areas may be great for oysters, what may not be, uh, or what areas may not be quite as good for oysters. Um, but it gives them the chance to be an active participant in, in their own environment. That's really cool. So can we take a look at sure, some of the oysters? Absolutely. All right. So this is a a typical oyster gardener or oyster garden I should say at a gardening site. Let me hand you that. All right. And so on average, a, a standard gardening site will get 100 spat set shell and four of these. So generally about 25 uh, spat set shell per garden. And with it being kind of mid-October, these animals have been here since early May. And I think we're gonna have a really nice clump right here. Yeah. So what you end up with is this original parent shell this is the recycled shell that came from the restaurant and was seasoned. This went to the hatchery and had oyster larvae set on it. And that's what you're seeing here. All of these oysters were those larvae and they've grown. And then if we look really closely, you'll actually see some wild set. So on top of the oyster that was set at the hatchery grow other larvae that may settle on the shell. Oyster larvae want to settle on hard substrate. And so this is a very natural product. You'd see this on the reef. It gives you a three-dimensional structure so you get great habitat. And then each one of these oysters is filtering uh, through their natural feeding behavior. And so, you know, they filter out phytoplankton as food. Anything that they're not gonna eat, they package up and kind of spit out the side and it sinks to the bottom as, as pseudo feces. And it helps clear the water column, which increases sunlight, which allows grasses and other native things that need sunlight to, to grow better. Uh, and it also connects the water column to the bottom, so to the benthic community. So this species is super important, and there are others that do it too, but oysters sort of provide that link. Yeah, so how do you maintain the gardens? So generally speaking, a gardener will um, shake these gardens at least once a week, once every 10 days. They grow so fast that if, they, if they're allowed to grow through the mesh, they kind of get locked up and we can't get them back out. Uh, easily without breaking them. Um, but the main things that, that gardeners are going to be looking for is predators, so primarily oyster drills, uh, big blue crabs, big stone crabs, things that'll hurt the oysters. But within here, you know, you'll see lots of little mud crabs and, and you know, maybe juvenile crabs that aren't going to hurt the oysters. But when you, when you look underneath, I mean, you can see the crabs and they'll scatter because, you know, we just shook their whole little world up. But these, yeah. these are really clean. I mean, believe it or not, this is a really clean basket. So, cause you've got really good openings in the mesh. So you get lots of great water flow. Uh, so it brings great food supply, lots of oxygen, uh, removes waste products uh, from, from the, uh, the oysters. And by uh, uh, having that type of flow, you'll get this kind of growth. So how does, how does a citizen get involved in oyster gardening? Well, the easiest way is to either call us or email us. The email is oystergardening at auburn.edu. So it's a super easy email to remember. But generally speaking, you have to live in an area that uh, has a pier and that is a, approved for um, uh, shellfish. And that's, that's, um, that's a map that's designated through the public health department. And we can work with an address and figure that out. Um, but generally, it's the lower third of the bay. And here on Little Lagoon, of course, this is unclassified water. So we have a special permit that allows us to do this work in Little Lagoon. And to join with Little Lagoon, you get involved with the Little Lagoon Preservation Society. And that's who's facilitating this project through here. So 
right now we're at Admiral Shellfish uh, Company. This is a private oyster farm, privately owned oyster farm, and we have a great relationship with the owner. The owner's actually an oyster gardener, uh, and we have worked an arrangement with him to stage some of our research uh, here on site. And then you can see that behind us on the tall pilings, you can see our boat back there working uh, some of that gear. Um, the purpose or the questions that we're looking at with, with this research, uh, we, we've just talked about oyster gardening and we've seen that sort of individual model for, for a single person. We like that citizen engagement, we want to maintain that, but we want to be able to grow more oysters in a location with less labor. And so that's what this research is looking at, is, is asking questions about, you know, how do, we, how do we get more oysters in a smaller footprint? Um, and specifically, we're evaluating different protective strategies for the broodstock. Uh, you know, the oyster gardeners spend quite a bit of time removing predators and making sure predators can't get there. We want to do that still, but we want it on a more passive uh, uh, setting. So we're looking at different treatments um, relative to how we hang the oysters, other uh, additives that we put in that structure to help prevent primarily that drill from being able to access it. And so right now, today, we're loading in the spat. And so this is what an oyster gardener would typically get in uh, May. So you see the very small juvenile oysters. These oysters are probably about a month old. And just for reference, there's my thumbnail. And this is about the size that they'll get them. Uh, and you know what we saw earlier where they were much larger, four or five months from now, these animals should be two and a half uh, or so inches. So they grow quite quickly as long as you uh, take care of them. And so one of the, the, the things that we'll see here is are we getting enough care, meaning are we getting enough flow, enough food, enough oxygen to still allow that robust growth while we minimize the handling of the oysters themselves. And so it's a research project but it's got a heavy extension component and uh, you know it's funded by Restore uh, and, and ADCNR and you know over the next five years as we answer these questions we should start to be able to uh, take what we're finding and run it into the oyster gardening program to expand that citizen uh, science experiential opportunity while having a larger positive impact on the oyster population of the Bay. So what's it look like if you wanted to actually farm? So if you farm want to stuff? farm oysters, what you want to do is raise single oysters. You want a pristine product for the half shell market. So you want a nice single oyster. So farmers want single oysters that they can raise in bags and baskets off bottom and raise that premium product. So that's what we've got over here. So what we've got here is these are single oysters that are destined to go to a farm. So these are, these are what we call diploid oysters. Um, these, these are normal oysters with two sets of chromosomes. Um, so the way we produce these oysters is we take a silo similar to this. We, we spread really finely ground oyster shell. It's, gr it's ground up to about the consistency of sand grains. And we spread that on the bottom of these silos. We put about 300,000 oyster larvae in one of these silos. And each little oyster larvae attaches to one grain of that ground up oyster shell. And from then on, it produces these, these single oysters. So in this one silo here, there's probably about 100, 125,000 oysters. Uh, doesn't look like a whole lot right now, but that's enough to supply a, a, a small farm, mom and pop operation. Uh, a small scale farm, would be harvesting, you know, 100,000, 150,000 oysters. Uh, so in this one tank, there's there's over a half million oysters. So that's the and that's what they what the farmer would call seed. So that's the seed that they take to their farm and put it in the bags. Right. All right. So today we're out here and we've got uh, some of the some of the staff from the from the hatchery out here with us and they're putting some seed out for for grow out initial grow out into the farm so this seed has spent the last probably six to eight weeks either in the nursery or in the 
in the larval stage at the hatchery and now it's coming out here on the farm. Um, it'll spend the rest of its term out here, whether it's for research or brood stock or going to be sent off to another place that we're collaborating with. The size of the seed that's out, it's coming out, it's about a four millimeter seed and it'll get handled about every two weeks until it gets to be about a 18 millimeter seed and then it's then we really decide what densities and and what we're going to do with that seed for different research projects or whatnot. So they're initially stocking those bags today at about 20,000 seed, four millimeter seed per bag. So um, I think they said they had a little of 322,000 seed I think that they brought out here in that in that one igloo cooler. We had the floating cage system, which is behind me here. That is a Canadian system. Uh, that was developed in Canada. Uh, the biggest issue they have up there is sea ice, where we have our biggest issue is hurricanes, as everybody has said, uh, up there is sea ice. So if you look, those pontoons have caps on the ends of them. So in the wintertime, they sink all their gear to the bottom up there and let winter happen over the top of their gear. Uh, and then when the ice goes out, they bring everything back up to the surface. It's very important for them to grow at the surface because that is the warmest water up there and has the most food for the oysters. Um, if they did midwater, we could grow an oyster here in the midwater, you know, a couple feet underwater, uh, and probably would do almost as well as at the surface. Sometimes if it gets really hot and the midwater is not as hot, it might actually do a little bit better. Uh, you're going to get more following down there, but um, whereas in Canada, they want everything up in that top layer. So that's where the, the floating cage works really well for them. For us, it works well because you can sink them here during a hurricane. So just like they would sink them for the ice, that's we have a hurricane plan for them is to sink them. The, the long line gear, uh, the, we don't have any baskets that are a small enough mesh. The manufacturers don't produce them. Uh, that are small enough mesh to start the process in that gear type. So everything starts, for us at least, starts in this gear type. Um, but when it gets to be in about a, an 8 to 10 millimeter seed, mm -hmm. that's when we can split it between gear types. Um, so when I was talking earlier about limitations and water depth and and needing to do that desiccation of the oysters it's to keep the oysters clean and also keep the baskets clean. So, But everything's been put together here uh, to maximize the space with the baskets. So we basically, this, this run from piling to piling is about 100 meters. That allows us to, to maximize the use of the tubing and the cable that everything hangs on. Between the PVC pipes is 100 inches because you can fit three baskets in there and they won't rub on each other or anything um, and then we can get 36 spots down through there so this this one set of lines is what we would call a run mm -hmm. uh, for our stuff and it can hold 216 baskets the long line gear type for a lot of our brood stock holding and and research holding we use that as our preferred gear type just because the the baskets are smaller, easier to deal with. Um, it gives you a smaller volume to be able to keep a certain amount of oysters in that you're putting away for research and whatnot. This is the spat on shell that we're using for the restoration project in Little Dauphin Bay. So they'll be out here probably for a few months in these baskets while they um, turn into clusters of oysters. Um, we want to get them to about an inch in size. Let me have it, Megan. I'll pull a few pieces out to show them kind of what the spat on show. Yeah, so this is kind of recycling our dead little shell. So we get a lot of uh, stuff that we don't keep and whatnot. But you can see on here, these are small spat baby oysters. So this is a, a different way of doing the restoration projects. A lot of the traditional stuff like oyster gardening, you're using full size pieces of shell. Um, that are pretty heavy and pretty cumbersome to deal with versus using using this. So you, what you want is a big enough piece of shell that you can use large mesh basket or bag like this so you can maximize that flow into there to help grow them up faster. Um, so next year we, we've started a project that Megan's one of the lead techs on. 
um, where we've put down a lot of shell and some of that shell that's been put down, some of it will be seeded with this stuff and some will be left to, to let the natural set come on to it. So they've been working this year on trying uh, kind of different shell sizes, different densities within here to see how they do. So for so next year when they when they hit the ground doing this, they'll they'll have that information. And restoration work like that is something that an oyster farmer could also get involved with if they did want to help with any restoration work. That's part of also why to do something like this because they. They could use their gear that they already have in place for their commercial operation and be able to utilize that gear uh, either at a certain time of the year when they weren't having when they didn't have enough oysters to fill it out or whatnot to be able to help with restoration work. So that that just clips on the line down there. Yeah. So Meg, maybe pull one side up and just show them how you connect those on there. So when we were at Murder Point, their baskets were kind of oval shaped, if you noticed. Their system is um, SEPA, so they use the SEPA system. So Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, we're out here at Sandy Bay Oyster Company. Uh, we're known for Murder Point Oysters. So I graduated from Auburn University in uh, 2015. Got my master's in fisheries and aquaculture. Um, my two years that I was working on my master's degree, I spent most of my time at the Auburn Selfish Lab on Dolphin Island. Uh, worked in the hatchery, worked out on the farm some, got a lot of experience working with oysters. Um, didn't have a background in oysters, but I learned a lot in my time there. I've been here since right about the time I graduated, I think six months after I was done with Auburn. I was out here, I was actually on an Auburn boat when I was approached from the, guy, the, the family that owns the company um, and offered the job. And I've been out here ever since and I love the work. You see the situation we're in, you know, being outdoors, being wet, being hot, this is, this is what we deal with. Um, but it's, you know, this is what I love doing, being out here in the water. Um, I spent a lot of time in our hatchery, so I learned a lot of technical skills uh, my time at Auburn. Um, but even just the day-to-day -day operations on the farm, it's a lot that I picked up. So what's your typical day look like? Oh, it's, it's all, yeah, that's, that's, that's the fun, day. yeah, it's different every day. But um, I usually start my day up in the hatchery because, um, you know, we, here at Murder Point, we, you know, from start to finish, we spawn the oysters, we produce the larvae, we get them out in the field, and then we farm them out here and get them to market. Um, but I've got my hands involved somewhere and everything out here. Um, I, my, my role has transitioned quite a bit since I started with the company. We've got a lot more employees now uh, than we did when I started out, um, and it's, it's growing. We've almost doubled every year just in, uh, in our production, um, and we hope that it continues that way. So um, I. From what I understand, you know, this, the whole industry has been booming. Um, it's when I began with Auburn, it was kind of a, a project that was going. Um, I'm sure y'all may have heard something about the oyster garden. I think it's kind of how it began, and it's become into you know a career for a lot of people around here. So why should someone further upstream care about what happens down here on the coast, further downstream? So it's a good question. It's an important question. The, the main thing is, is it's all connected. So anything that, that gets into the water upstream, so it's in a creek, it's in a, a stream or a river, you know, you spill something on the ground, it gets washed down the gutter into the storm water and it goes out into the creek, that ends up down here. So whether it's extra nutrients or if it's sediment from construction, whatever it may be, it's just trash it comes down here. Lots and lots of people come down here on vacation from upstream. And so really the question that we would turn back is, when you come on vacation, do you want to come swim with that Coke bottle or uh, water bottle that you threw out the truck window? Probably not. If you see it on the ground, you probably think, God, you know, why are people throwing trash on the ground? It's all connected. So if you throw it on the ground upstream, it's coming down here. Yeah, so ultimately impacts your experience the food that you eat down yes, here, everything. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so whether it's fertilizer that's, you know, excessive fertilizer that you're putting on your yard or your garden that's getting washed off in the big rainstorm, all of that works its way down here and it'll have an effect. But when you look at the watershed map of Alabama, you know, a huge percentage of Alabama, almost 70% flows into the bay. Portions of Georgia flow into the bay. Portions of southern Tennessee, 
uh, eastern Mississippi, all connected, flowing into the bay. And again, when you come down here, you know, we love to see you. We want you to have fun. We want you to enjoy the seafood. And we're pretty sure that you don't want to swim in trash yeah. and pollution that, that came from upstream. So we have work to do down here for sure in terms of litter uh, control and uh, pollution. But because of the connectivity of a watershed, we all have a responsibility to uh, take care of, of what goes on to the ground and ultimately uh, moves downstream. Yeah. So everyone plays a part. Everyone does. So why do you love oysters so much? <laughs> I just think they're neat. I mean, they're, they're, uh, they build these magnificent reefs. They provide so much habitat and so much ecological value um, for, for the estuary. I really want to see it be clean for, for my uh, daughter. And, you know, oysters are a big part of that. And so it's, it's important to me to see that these things thrive.